Welcome to A Walk in the Garden. I'm Liz Davey, and this series of garden and cooking shows is being filmed in my garden in Norfolk by NCTV Norfolk Community Cable. I'm here in my herb garden this morning, and it's a lovely early August day. The heat uh, that we've had over the last month, actually July I think was hotter than usual, and a little more humid too, but today is a lovely day with a light breeze and warm temperatures but the humidity has not crept up yet, uh, but it's going to creep up in the days to come. So we'll enjoy today and be outside in the garden. Today, uh, I'm in the herb garden and I've been picking herbs, I've been drying herbs, uh, getting ready for winter. It is August and we're starting to think that yes, fall will eventually come. So I'm picking some of the herbs before they bloom to dry, but I'm also going to pick a few herbs for my shed and I'm going to clip off some of the southern wood. We've got some pretty long tails here. And these will repel insects. When I'm working in the shed, I've been putting a little bouquet of them out there. And it keeps the flies and the mosquitoes out of the shed while I'm working. Because I do keep the door open while I'm out there. And it works quite well. But these I'm going to put out there and let them dry. And they will discourage not only insects, but also mice from uh, deciding to make it their winter home. So a couple dried bouquets of this are helpful. They don't completely eliminate the problem, but uh, they do help a lot. Especially if I put the dried herbs in the places where mice like to hide and build a nest. So I'm using southern wood and rue, which is another uh, herb that's got pretty little yellow flowers. Uh, but it's not an edible herb, nor is the southern wood. Though perhaps in days past they were used medicinally. The other one is uh, tansy. And it too probably was used medicinally once, but is no longer. It has a very pungent odor, as do all the rest. So that is what makes it perfect for the use we're going to use. It for. Uh, it's the smell that they don't like. I find them not too bad. They smell just kind of green, but a little pungent as well. And I have a rubber band around my arm. And we'll just rubber band them together. And then I can take them out to my shed and hang them up and they will repel insects for a while and also mice and any other critters that would like to make a home in my shed. The potted plants have needed some water the last few days. We've had quite a bit of rain as well as warm temperatures, so the garden hasn't suffered too badly this year. This is a garden that I find very difficult to add water to except by hand, so a lot of the herbs don't get any water and they just are here to grow as the weather permits. This year they've gotten a little more uh, rain than usual, but I do hand water a few of them. I have some uh, basil back in this area, and also I have a potted rosemary and a potted bay. Those will be coming in in the winter, and I do need to keep them watered. Anything in a pot tends to dry out a little faster than anything in the ground. We can start, uh, as I said, keep picking all the herbs. Some of them have started to go to seed. And if you wish, you can clip them back, but I tend to let the ones go to seed that are doing so right now. Those are the uh, lime balm and the lemon balm. I've been picking the rosemary. Some of it has also started to flower, and it has pretty little flowers. You can even put them in a floral arrangement. The rue, again, is flowering, and we're getting a few blooms on the garlic chives. This is a chive that has late blooms in white. I have several bunches of it, and you can see uh, they're just starting to come out. They have a little purple tinge as they start to come out, but for the most part, they are white. Now let's move down to the perennial garden and see what's happening there. 
I have a little grape arbor that's on the edge of my perennial garden, and this year we have quite a few grapes that are starting. I will need to water this if we don't get an inch of rain a week, and it looks like I may need to give it a little supplemental water this week based on the forecast, unless we get a good thunderstorm that drops a lot of water at once. I have a lot, two different grape vines in this, and I didn't prune them this year. I didn't get around to it. And boy, has it taken off. We have vines everywhere and grapes coming down from the top, which will be easy to pick. These are seedless grapes, and uh, we're looking forward to having those probably in late August or early September. We can start picking them and hopefully get here before the birds do. Now I'll move over to the perennial garden. And we have a few things blooming. The yarrow is still going strong here. Uh, it turns white. Uh, the initial blooms are pink. And we can start deadheading that when they start to turn brown. And we can just cut off, cut them off. And we may even get a few more blooms before the uh, fall. But uh, anything that turns completely brown, I'll just cut off and see if we can get some more blooms. And these can just be put in the compost at this time. It is a butterfly favorite. And we have a few more things coming up here. A tall verbena, which is starting to grow now that some of the bulbs are out on the foliage. Some of the things underneath have started to take off. Leave that there for now. I have Heliopsis, which is a yellow sunflower, and that too can be deadheaded. And hopefully we'll get a few more blooms from that by cutting off the old blooms. And there's quite a few of those to cut back. As long as it's getting what it needs, it should continue to put out a few blooms going into the fall. Echinacea is the pink sunflower type plant, and it too can be deadheaded. These are platycodon. They're blue, and they reseed vigorously, so I'll want to take off any of the pods that have already bloomed on this one and either compost or trash them if you don't want any more. If you want more of this, by all means, put the seeds where you want it to grow, and it will grow. Some of the fall plants are starting to put on buds. This is an aster, a fall aster, which is uh, probably going to be moved next year. It's gotten a little larger than I thought it would. And I have another plant, uh, Dianthus. It's smaller than I thought it would be, so they'll probably get to swap either this fall or in the spring. It's time to kind of look around and see what you need to add or what you need to subtract, move, divide, all those things, and kind of keep a list of it. The daylilies have pretty much finished blooming. Some of them will continue to bloom into fall. The Stelladoro, Happy Returns, that type. But other than that, we can just cut off the bloom stalks once they've finished blooming. This one is Little Gray Pet and it's been covered with blossoms all season, all day lily season. There's just a few left. It may put out another one or two as the time goes by, depending on the weather, whether it's warm and whether we get enough rain. The lilies have all been deadheaded once they've finished. We let the foliage provide the energy for the bulb that's underneath and it will hopefully bloom again next year. I have a Montauk daisy in this area, which I cut back in May, and it's starting to form buds. It should bloom in the fall, as will the Eupatorium, which is the dark foliage. It will have a white bloom. In the back, I have some Baltonia, which is a, looks like an aster. Many people refer to it as an aster. It's not really an aster, but it too will have white blooms. I failed to support some of the plants that kind of sprawled. And this is the Boltonia, and it had lovely blue flowers on it. It's kind of a pea relative, 
as you can see by the pods that it puts on as its seeds. I'm leaving some of the seeds because I find them interesting. And next year I want to be sure to support that so that it doesn't sprawl all over everything else. It makes it difficult to weed in there. In the back I have a wild quinine, which is a native plant, and some grass. And the grass is a uh, heavy metal is the name of it, and it's starting to put on its bloom stalks and pods, uh, letting us know that fall indeed is on the way eventually. I have some goldenrod here. Uh, goldenrod is not the cause of the fall allergies. It's often blamed, but the pollen is from ragweed, which has a very insignificant bloom, which causes a great deal of problems for people with allergies. But goldenrod really doesn't cause the problem. It just happens to bloom at the same time, and it has a showier bloom. It will spread, so I need to be careful uh, to pull up any that I don't want as I'm weeding in the spring, or I won't let it go to seed. I'll just pick it before it does. In front of that, which should be a nice combination, is a purple aster. And these, I have pink and purple. I think this one actually is a pink one. And it will look nice with the bright yellow of the goldenrod. The poppy is gone that was here. And uh, it will start putting on some foliage a little later in the fall. We have a lot of dragonflies this year here and there. I can start removing these supports. They're not supporting anything, so I might as well get a heart uh, step up on fall cleaning and put these away. More asters in the back and the butterfly weed, and it's making pods. I plan to save seed from these. In fact, saving seed is something I'm starting to do right now, and we will in just a few minutes. But I'm saving seed from the butterfly weed, so I will let the pods stay on it until they brown up. We have a few more blooms of it here, and the butterflies are loving that. Also, the rose that I have here, and other roses that I have, are starting with a second set of blooms. Generally, roses bloom in waves, and this is a wave that's in the late summer. And I'm going to give it one more dose of rose fertilizer. And this time it's going to be a half dose. We want it to continue blooming now, but we don't want it to set new growth before fall. This is the last feeding of the season for it. And I do want to water that in and dig it in a bit. Roses need about five gallons of water a week. If they're not getting it with rain, you need to provide it if you want them to thrive. We put that the fertilizer around under the growing parts. Any leaves with problems we take off and compost, or don't compost, I'm sorry, we trash them. You don't want to spread diseases. But I gave this one two gallons of water along with the fertilizer. If it doesn't rain this week, it'll get another three gallons before the week is out. Some of the annuals that I planted underneath, the salosa that I started indoors in February, it's starting to bloom and it has pink blooms. And there are a few in here that we've been watching. And it can be fertilized all through the season with a little liquid fertilizer and definitely will need some water. I've already collected seed from this lichnus. You can see it's, there's a few seeds left, but I just turned it up over a cup and collected the seeds, so now I can cut those shoots right off. It's a native plant that the butterflies really like. It's bright red, and it bloomed about a month ago. Moving over this way, we have the last of the lilies, and again, I deadhead the plants once they've gone by. Echinops are blooming, and in the background, 
You can see the tall spikes, and that is the tall verbena. And I grew that from seed the first year, and it, it will, I will let it go to seed where it is. It is an annual, but it will reseed, and it will come back next year. And I would like to spread some of those seeds so that I have some clumps of that in various places throughout the garden. You can do that if you have things that are going to seed. You can select where you'd like to grow them and put the seeds in now. If they are a reseeding annual or perennial, they will come up. And this is the time that you can plant new perennials for future years. They may take a couple years before they bloom, but they're there. The Alium Millennium is putting on blossoms. We've had Alium pretty much since the chives bloomed in May. And Aliums of one sort of another, they're either decorative or edible. Uh, these happen to be decorative. This is a new plant for me. I expect it to grow quite a lot larger, but it adds a lot of color right now when other things are starting to go. Another day lily that's ready to go, and again, this will be in another week ready to be cut back along the way. A pot of plant, a potted plant, the uh, Nicotiana or flowering tobacco has a sweet scent and I've started that in the winter, put it into the pot and again I'll need to keep that one watered. Behind it is a lemongrass and that is edible. Uh, lemongrass is added to a lot of Thai and oriental dishes and we can start using that. Unfortunately it is an annual, very tender. It will not last the winter. You can try bringing it in and I usually do but I have not been successful in keeping it over the winter for another year. We have plenty of bumblebees and honeybees on the remaining monarda, our, our butter, our, uh, and it's ready to go, and I will deadhead that. Uh, as you can see, it has spread by seed quite a lot, so I will want to Make sure I get these blooms off of here. I don't need to be digging up tons of it next year, and it will go to seed. I could take some of the seeds and put them elsewhere in the garden, but I've already done that at least once, so I think it's time to make sure it goes. Again, a few more daylilies, and we'll just snip off any areas that aren't going to bloom anymore rather than letting them go to seed. Black-eyed Susans are, again, a nice plant, and we'll keep those deadheaded, and hopefully we can keep them blooming a little bit longer this year. Coming up this way, I'm going to reach over and grab my cup. These are the annual poppies that were so pretty about a month ago, and now they're going to seed. And the, they're another one that will reseed. They're an annual poppy. And all I have to do is turn them upside down and shake them. And I will be able to get plenty of seed. I'll take the cup inside. We wait until they're starting to brown. And then just shake it over. There will be plenty that fall on the ground anyway, so I will have more poppies here next year. The only way I would get rid of them is to weed them out in the spring. I've labeled my container because I collect quite a few different seeds, and if I don't label them, it's very easy to wonder, what in the world are these? So I label them now. We'll put them inside and make sure they're completely dry before storing them in little envelopes and possibly sharing some of them with the library, seed library uh, at the Norfolk Public Library. We'll be collecting seeds for that this fall, and I'll have some contributions for it, including these lovely pink poppies. Actually, these can be seeded either in the spring or right now they can be spread around and then they'll come up in the spring. 
as they do in the garden when they just naturally seed themselves. This is another rose that's blooming, and we'll bring that fertilizer up here and give that another half dose too. This tends to have some very nice fall blooms that aren't bothered too much by insects, and it really adds to the color in the garden. I did read that if you have a problem with Japanese beetles on your roses, a spritz of Windex will do the job. Uh, I haven't tried it, but uh, I will if I see a problem. Now we're going to move over to the vegetable garden. I'm here in the vegetable garden and it's time to harvest the garlic. In fact, it may be a little past time because some of the leaves are already down and I'm going to use a fork to loosen it. And shake it off a little bit. You see we have a nice head of garlic. And we'll go along and I'm going to put this in my basket and continue all down my row. We'll shake off some of the dirt, some of it will come off later. And I'll put all the garlic in my basket and then take it out to my little sunshed, which is very airy and not very bright. And get some of the dirt off. And we'll let it cure. By curing, I mean let it dry. And I'll just let it dry with my, the stems on for a couple weeks. And then I'll go out and with a brush and my clippers and clip it off, brush it off. And it will keep pretty much all winter until I have garlic again, especially if I freeze some of the cloves later in the season. You can grow enough garlic to last all year. And we're hoping that's the case here. It looks pretty good this year. We'll save a few cloves to plant in October, or I'll buy some new cloves. There's one that uh, I let go to seed. Remember I came out and I cut the garlic scapes for use early, but one of them went to seed. And you'll see I have little teeny garlics on top of that, little garlic seeds. If I were to plant those in October or even now and leave them, they would start to make a garlic clove. Then I could plant those cloves next year. So it would be two years before I got a crop from the ones that grew on top. These are calendulas, and they just kind of reseed themselves around my garden. But they're cheerful, and I like them. They're also an edible flower, so you can use the petals in rice or cookies. And they're just a cheerful addition. This is uh, coriander, or that was cilantro, and it's starting to form seeds, which are coriander. And when those turn brown, I can harvest those as coriander. You'll see there's a lot growing here and there. That's because they seed themselves naturally into the garden now, and then they'll come up next spring. Doesn't matter if I plow the garden or not, it still comes up. My first crop of raspberries is finished, but my later raspberries are just starting, and I'm able to get enough for cereal or a bit of dessert now and hopefully a little larger crop later. Again, they will need some water if we want to have a good crop. These are cabbages. And up until this morning, I had them covered. So I have a few weeds around them. You can pull. These are a small cabbage, uh, about enough for two people. And that's the type that they are. You can grow humongous cabbages, but these little ones are very nice because they make just enough for a couple people. I left the net in. I'm having a horrible time with rabbits. Uh, I had the cabbage covered with claws. I have some of the other things covered right now. And last week, I beefed up the fence. I put in a, set, a third line of wire around my electric fence, 
We have a taller wire to keep any deer out that might want to come in. And around the side and back, I put in what's called rabbit fence all the way around, which has closer spaced wiring around the bottom, which will hopefully keep the rabbits out. I don't think anything will keep the little bitty rabbits out, but they don't eat as much as the big rabbits. So we want to focus on keeping out the larger ones, which were starting to do quite a bit of damage. They uh, were able to damage the cabbages a bit, and also my kale and parasacaba, which is a broccoli relative, and they were starting to get the broccoli as well. So it was time for some action to keep them out. They're very persistent. Uh, but there's plenty of food for the rabbits in the area, uh, including a lot of clover in my lawn, so I don't feel too badly about excluding them. Now I'm going to go up to the other end. The garden's pretty full, but there's still a little space to plant some things, and yes, we can still plant, although we're getting near the end of time to plant anything that will survive and be harvestable by the time we get our first frost. Lately, we haven't been getting a hard frost until about October, so it's a good, we have a couple months left. So early August is about the deadline for planting lettuce, carrots, beets, and today I'm planting spinach. And this is a variety that is supposed to be especially good for fall planting, so. We're going to just spread it fairly thickly in this area. I've already dug a trench and added a little compost to increase the soil fertility. And then we'll just cover it and pat it down. I'll put a rock where I stop. I can continue to plant lettuce, kale, beets and carrots, although they may be very small when harvested. And even another row of beans, if you wish. It's still time to get some green beans in. Although we've had so many green beans, I think we'll be tired enough of beans that we probably won't plant any more here. But the spinach, I will now need to keep moist. It's very important that you keep any seeds that you plant now quite moist. If it's really a dry season, I would wet some newspaper strips and put that over my seed bed to try to hold in the moisture. We want to be sure to keep it nice and moist so that the seeds will germinate. The broccoli has been attacked by the rabbits, but we still have a head to pick. And I have a knife for that. I'll just pick, pick the center of it. Now, I will not get rid of the plant because it will probably put on some side shoots and we can often get broccoli right into November. It's very cold tolerant and even these shabby looking plants may put out broccoli until that time. It won't be larger heads but smaller ones but you're going to cut it up to use it anyway so the small heads are just as good as the large ones so don't dig it up. On the other hand, if you've planted cauliflower and you've harvested the head, it's finished. It will not give you any more heads of cauliflower. So cauliflower is a pretty much one harvest per plant. This is celery, and I can use that now. It's small, but it's very tasty. If you've never had homegrown celery, it's very delicious. I'll need to start using that and use that before we do get a frost because it will not survive a hard frost at all. This is the uh, fennel that I planted in hopes of having fennel bulbs. Well, it looks like I'm not going to have any bulbs. It got too hot, evidently, and instead of forming bulbs, it's going to seed. So I guess we won't have any fennel bulbs, but I can use some of the stems and definitely the fronds of flowers for fennel flavoring. I have arugula that we planted. This is the second crop of arugula for greens. Uh, eggplant is starting to form uh, blossoms. It's a little late this year. I got it in late. More dill. Uh, some of my dill is going to seed, but some isn't. We have peppers. 
And I have some Italian frying peppers, which are long and narrow. And again, I have a knife to cut those. We'll add that to the basket. And I have some regular peppers as well, which I have picked. The other thing that started to really take off are my cucumbers. And I've picked quite a few already, and we can continue to pick them. It's fun to hunt for them within the foliage. But uh, a lot of them are growing up where you can reach them. And there are plenty of more little ones ready to be picked. Here's another good sized one. And you, you need to do a little hunting to find them. The same with the squash over here. We have summer squash and also some zucchini. And And I have zucchini as well. And I grow one that is round instead of long. Some years I grow long ones, some years I grow round ones. We like the flavor of these. So I grew round ones this year. I also have beans. Unfortunately, I planted beans a little clo too close to the squash this year. We'll have to remember that next year and try to keep them away. A few tomatoes are starting. These are plump uh, little cherry tomatoes. And they grow in clusters. A few clusters of those. A few other tomatoes getting ripe. If you have them in your garden, it's nice to wait till they're completely ripe before you pick them. Unlike the ones that you buy in the store, they don't have to sit on the counter for three days to get ripe. Uh, and they're wonderful, fresh from the garden. I have plum tomatoes, cherry tomatoes, and regular round tomatoes, and a few, and at least one heirloom tomato, maybe two. All of the herbs in the garden are ready to be cut. This is a, and if you want to preserve your herbs, the basils particularly, remove the part that's going to seed. Just remove that and compost it and then you'll continue to get some leaves. Uh, its job is to go to seed, and we want to keep it from going to seed. This is a lime basil. It has a lime flavor. Next to that's a little marjoram, and then uh, another crop of cilantro, which we particularly enjoy. Then we have some flowers here and there, which will be starting to bloom and are blooming for some nice bouquets inside. And the butterflies are loving those. So we usually have a few butterflies flitting around. I guess not right now. They saw the camera, evidently. Okay, now let's go out and back and see what's going on out there. The coleus that we planted in the planters from cuttings that I took last fall has really grown. I've been fertilizing it about every two weeks and also pinching it. And that means taking the little centers out of the clusters of leaves. These will be ready to take more cuttings. This particular coleus plant, coleus plant or its relatives, probably more its relatives, have been growing these uh, two for probably about four years. Each fall I take some cuttings, grow them through the winter, and then bring them out in the spring. These two varieties, this stripy one and the plain bright green one, have survived and come back for several years. It really helps if you can take some cuttings because then you aren't buying these little plants every spring. You have your own little plants to put in and it does take off and fill in before the season's over. Hydrangeas are in bloom. This is an oak leaf hydrangea and the blooms start out white and then start turning pink. Later on the leaves of this plant, and they're very large, will turn a kind of burgundy color. So it's a very nice plant for many seasons. The plant has gotten quite big as it does and it can be pruned back in the spring. I'll wait till spring to prune most of it. Another type of hydrangea is this one and its blooms start white and become green. And this is a great plant for picking for wreaths and crafts. And you can start picking it about now and these will dry and maintain their greenness pretty much all winter. 
So it's a good plant. You can pick, start picking it now and then uh, continue. It's going to stay this light green color until it starts to turn brown. But if you pick it at the green stage, when it's just started to get a little dry, it will stay like this for quite a long time without water. The other thing you can do is pick a bouquet, put it in a little water, and then just let it dry naturally inside. It makes a very nice plant to make a wreath. The blooms can actually be painted once they're dry if you desire a different color. I have some blooms that are blue. Uh, they tend to turn a little pink before I can harvest them. If you pick this in a too young stage, it will just wilt. It will not dry properly. I notice a hydrangea roller over here, a leaf roller. This is an insect that rolls up the leaf to make its home. And this one has departed because I can see a hole in the leaf. The moth lies its, lays its eggs in a leaf and then seals it closed and makes a little home for her children. And then they hatch inside and work their way, eat their way out and then they will also turn into a moth later on. It's one of the problems with hydrangeas and I just go around and open them up and then the birds take care of the little critter that's inside if it gets too numerous. A couple of them don't make any difference. I have a lot of ferns and they will need some water if it's dry, but as long as they're in the shade, they're usually just fine. I've let some of my pipe vine come up in my rocks here and I'm going to be digging those to share later on. I, I don't want pipe vine out here, but that's where it wants to go. So I will dig these up and put them in pots very soon and uh, keep them so that I can share them. Uh, it's a butterfly plant that is the home and feeding ground of the pipe vine swallowtail. So it's nice to have the pipe vine. I have one growing up there, and, but it tends to get a little uh, rambunctious and come up all over the place. So we'll dig those out a little later. Usually I dig them out right away, but these I want to share. All right, let's go back by the pond. Just going to feed the fish. Not too much to do in the shade garden today. In the shed, I've put things like the alium blossoms that I want to dry and use later in uh, decorations. We have some grasses coming up that I could cut back. The astilbe is already finished, but its seed heads look kind of nice. This is uh, alt grass. That is one of the few grasses that will grow in the shade and it will turn kind of an amber color later in the fall. Turtle head, which has buds on it. This is blooms very late. I have a pink one and a white one. The white one is native, actually, and it prefers a rather damp area. It's been rather damp in this area this spring, so we should have some nice blooms on the white one. Hostas are still blooming. We have a few that have already gone by, and I've taken the bloom stalks off. We have one that's just blooming now. Hostas will bloom any time from about June right up until September, depending on the variety that you have. So if you have a lot of different ones, you can expect blooms throughout the season. I have some annuals here, the impatience that we started way back in February are still going strong. Uh, they don't even need to be deadheaded. I can collect some seeds from those as they start to as the days start to get shorter, they will form seed pods that I can uh, save seeds uh, from them. And again, I grow those from the same seeds each year. These have been growing, I think, three or four years, saving seeds and replanting them every February. So you can save some seeds and have success with them growing from year to year. I have three containers of impatience. Several years ago, there was a virus that kind of wiped out a lot of the impatience. I've had no problems with it, but I do keep them out of the ground. I plant them in potting soil. I only put a few in the ground uh, here and there, but the majority of them I do put in planters so that they are in fresh soil. And I have not had a virus problem with them, so hopefully that is a thing of the past, and it was just a specific 
year and group of seeds that caused it. I'll put this back. The pond is doing well. We aren't having too many things uh, fall into it leaf-wise. It'll be time to put on a leaf net in another month at least when the leaves start falling in great numbers. I have quite a few uh, fish, seven to be exact, that are still there and enjoying their happy home. I feed them maybe once or twice a day, but if I go away for a weekend, they're perfectly fine. They don't need food every day, though they do like it and generally come right up to get it. We haven't had any problems with the blue heron. Hopefully my little decoy heron has helped a little bit in keeping the heron away, but we'll see more later on. Uh, my real problem with the heron came when the leaves were off the trees and he could very easily see into my pond and see the fish. So we'll have to wait and see. I do have a hiding place for them now that I didn't have before, and I think that may help as well. The plants that are in the pond will get one more fertilization and I can do that uh, very soon, this week, and then they will be coming in for the winter in time to miss the first heavy frost. I want them to grow inside all winter. They usually just make it. They uh, don't thrive inside as they do out here in the pond, but they will continue and I can bring them out again. Two of them have been here for several years and I added a third one this year and hopefully I will have three that survive the winter. Every once in a while I do lose one, so it's just part of, part of gardening. Uh, a few plants will make it and a few won't. I try not to take in too many, but I always seem to take in a lot more than I think I'm going to, with, along with cuttings. We'll have some bulbs to dig later on, and then we can, uh, again, start thinking about next year's garden, believe it or not, and what we want to do differently. Start to make some notes as to where you might want to add some color, and where you might want to divide something, and where you might want to uh, share with somebody else some plants that have done really well this year. Let's go in now and see what we can do with all that produce that we picked in the garden. Today we're going to use some of the lovely produce that's from the garden and also from the local area. And I went out and picked blueberries at Jane and Paul's, which is Norfolk's blueberry farm. And in the course of about a half an hour, got seven pounds of berries with two people picking. The berries are very plentiful this year. Again, the warm weather and the nice rain that we've had have really produced a lovely crop. I did freeze some of them. We ate quite a few of them, just out of hand. And today I'm going to make some blueberry bars. And I've put a cup and a half of flour into the food processor. And I'm going to add to that half a cup of sugar. half a teaspoon of baking powder, and just a pinch of salt. And the grated rind of half a lemon. I'll make sure that gets in there. If you double this, I'm making an eight ounce pan. If you double it, it will be a nine by 13 pan. I cut it in half. Then I'll add one stick of butter cut into cubes. And we're going to spin that until it makes some crumbs, fine crumbs. the equivalent of half an egg. And I've used egg product, the, the uh, kind that you get that's uh, cholesterol free, simply because it's easier to measure. If you use half an egg, it would be two tablespoons of a 
beaten up egg. And then we'll just mix that until it comes together. I think it's kind of crumbly. Looks like we're there. And then I'll put half of those into an 8 inch square pan. And I want to spread it around. This is a lemony crust mixture. And I'm going to pat that into the pan just with my fingers. I have two cups of blueberries for the topping, and I'll add a quarter cup of sugar and two teaspoons of cornstarch. This is going to thicken the filling. I'm going to stir that around in my berries. I used the uh, zest or peel of half a lemon in the crust, and I'm going to use the juice from ha that half lemon in the filling. And I'll stir that until it coats the berries with. Lost one. put those into the crust and spread them around. And then I'm going to put the rest of the crust material on top and sprinkle it on. Put that into a 350 degree oven, I'll shake it around a little bit, for 45 minutes. And we'll have blueberry bars. Once it comes out of the oven, it needs to be cooled and then refrigerated for at least an hour. It will be much easier to cut if you do refrigerate it. Now, the next thing I'll make is a Tuscan chicken dish. And I've already cooked four strips of bacon, which has been cut into little pieces. And I'm going to heat up my fry pan. I've uh, left about a tablespoon of the bacon fat in the pan. I've cut up one chicken breast uh, into, oh, a little better than bite-sized pieces, probably. And I'm going to add those to the hot pan and let them brown. And spread them out into one layer. I'm browning it up on one side, and now we'll give it a stir and continue cooking it until it's pretty well done. Again, it's important that poultry be well cooked. Just to make sure the chicken's at the uh, desired temperature, I'm going to use my thermometer and make sure that it's at least up to 165 degrees. 
which is a safe temperature for poultry. And it is. So we're going to take it out and add it to the bacon that I had already cooked. And turn the heat down to medium. piece. All right, now we'll add two teaspoons of minced garlic. And cook that in the remaining juices. garlic is just a slight brown and mostly just translucent. I'm going to add four chopped plum tomatoes and one cup of cream. bring that to a simmer. Okay, now we're simmering. I'm going to add five ounces of spinach, which has been washed and cut in smaller pieces, or you could use baby spinach. This is the perpetual spinach from my garden, which is actually a charred relative, but it's quite mild. So we're going to add that just until it's wilted. And that looks pretty wilted. Then we'll add the rest of the ingredients. And the rest of the ingredients would include 12 ounces of cooked fettuccine. And stir that in. the chicken and bacon, which has already been cooked. So basically we're just reheating at this point. And if your fettuccine had just been cooked, mine had, was holding for a while, had been chilled, it wouldn't take as long. And also three quarters of a cup of shredded Parmesan cheese. And we're gonna just mix that all together until it's all heated up and has come together. For our Tuscan chicken. And we can't be in Fran in Italy to or France, but we can certainly have the fresh flavors right here with our garden produce and some chicken and some fettuccine. And that's pretty much the dish completed. I'll move that over to this burner and we'll garnish that with about three tablespoons of fresh chopped basil. getting in those good flavors. If you're keeping basil in the kitchen, the best way to keep it is in a little water in a container, and then you'll have it ready. Uh, it will last much longer than that. It turns a very unappetizing black color if you put it in the refrigerator, but it will last on the counter for quite a while. So we'll put that out on the counter. 
The next thing I want to do is some green beans. We've had quite a few green beans, and so I'm going to heat up about two tablespoons of olive oil, and I've already blanched the green beans, and by blanching, I mean I have uh, plunged them into boiling water for about two minutes, and then into ice water. They keep their nice green color, they're tender crisp, and if you wished, you could just put them in the freezer right now after you've drained them. They're nice and cold. Just pack them in containers and they freeze. You do need to blanch them or they become woody in the freezer. But uh, once you've blanched them, you stop the enzyme processes that cause a plant to mature. You stop it in its tracks and then you can freeze it successfully. I'm going to put these in with the oil. Get a little sizzle and we're just going to brown them a little bit in the oil. I'm going to make a topping for them that's a, an Italian topping called gremolata, which is uh, often used on meat rather than on vegetables, but it works very nicely on green beans too. I'm starting with uh, three tablespoons of chopped parsley and three tablespoons of finely grated Parmesan cheese. And I want to add two teaspoons of minced garlic. And I've got to look at my list here. One tablespoon of lemon zest. I'm very outside of the lemon. And three tables, two tablespoons of pine nuts, which have been browned, just browned in a dry frying pan. And I'm going to stir this around. And this is the gremolata that will be added on to our green beans once we put them in the serving dish. See how these are doing? Yeah. Getting a little browned on the edges. I'll add those to the serving dish. And then we'll sprinkle it with the, the gremolata. Again, I found this recipe online, and as I did the uh, other two as well. A lot of things you can find online to use produce that you have. Rather than wasting it, uh, always look and see if you can find something interesting to do with it. So we have our green bean scramolata, Tuscan chicken casserole or skillet. And we'll check our blueberries, and I think we have some blueberries too. Blueberry squares for dessert. A very seasonal meal in New England. We'll move up the a flower arrangement, flowers from the garden, and of course a little bit of basil as well. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Liz Davey. You've been watching a Walk in the Garden on NCTV, Norfolk Community Cable. Join me again next time when we see what we can find in the garden and how we can cook it in the kitchen.